Hi, everybody. I wanted to speak to you inside because I want to read you something, and I thought it might be a bit windy outside and a bit hard to do that. Uh, congratulations to everybody here on so much hard work to get us to this day. I was lucky enough to be here last fall to visit the boat, and it's obviously so much better put together now. It doesn't smell like fuel anymore, and uh, the painting all looks great. The artwork inside, it has liveliness. It just looks like a lovely environment. And I want to go back again with Stefano just for a moment because I remember some early conversations about a research boat that we might build long before we found this, this hull. Um, do you think we ended up with the short skirt or the long gown? You have to let me know what you think. So we've talked a lot about the mission of the ship and, and what's going to happen in the next few years. Uh, I'd like to think the boat will have many, many missions. Um, but it really has a single purpose, and maybe that goes to the vision that we were speaking about earlier. Why did we start the Schmidt Ocean Institute? What problem are we trying to solve? It's really one very simple problem. Basically, in a world of information and technology that we live in where we're collecting all the world's information, there's so little known about the Earth's life support system, what Sylvia Earle likes to call the blue heart of the planet. And so the purpose of this ship as she leaves on her various missions is to communicate about the science of the oceans to people so that they can care about it. We can't take care of something we don't understand, and we can't care if we don't know. So let's never forget the purpose of the ship as, as she leaves this yard. Um, there is so much to learn that in the last decade alone, we have discovered a million different ocean microorganisms that nobody thought existed. They thought there were 5,000. And now we know there are millions, and they're different all over the ocean. It's not a big soup. So we're really just at the beginning of a transformation of our understanding, really a sea change, if you will, uh, from one century to another in the way we think about ourselves in connection to the world around us. So let me take a minute to talk about the name of the boat. Uh, we're all really fond of it. Uh, everybody knows it comes from the never-ending story that was written by Michael Endy here in Germany in 1979. And I read this book to my children. It was translated into English about that time. It was one of our favorite books. So when C. Falke came into the, our, our world, it seemed like a pretty natural transition to go to something more magical, to, to call upon Falcar the luck dragon in the never-ending story. For those of you who've read the book, you know luck dragons fly without wings. They, are, they have pearly scales. And they're not particularly strong, and they're not particularly magical or anything like that, but they're extremely lucky. So in that sense, we have a really great name. So I thought, well, I'll go back in the book, and it'd be fun at the um, launch of the boat to read a little bit from the book. So this was the first passage I, I came upon uh, about luck dragons. Uh, they are creatures of air, warmth, and pure joy. Despite their great size, they're as light as a summer cloud and consequently need no wings for flying. They swim in the air of heaven as fish swim in water. Seen from the earth, they look like slow lightning flashes. The most amazing thing about them is their song. Their voice sounds like a golden note of a large bell, and when they speak softly, the bell seems to be ringing in the distance. Anyone who has heard this sound will remember it as long as he lives and tell his grandchildren about it. And I thought, well, that's great. Isn't that a beautiful name? We've got Falcor. We're, we're all set, right? So I go ahead and I find another passage. I'm going through the book, and then I find this one. Luck dragons, as we know, are creatures of air and fire. Not only is the liquid element alien to them, it is also their enemy. Water can extinguish them like a flame. It can also asphyxiate them, for they never stop breathing in air through their thousands of pearly scales. <clears throat> they feed on air and heat and require no other nourishment, but without air and heat, they can live only a short time. I thought, we have a problem. <laughs> In fact, I discovered this um, on Thursday last week. <laughs> and I know we've got it all painted up and everything's great. And I thought, we really need an answer to this. What are we going to do? Well, let's find some more passages. Maybe there's a way to backpedal out of this. And it turns out, there is. And uh, our captain already knows about it. And Nigel already knows about it since I toured the boat. So I'm really happy to hear that. Here you go. While searching tirely, tirelessly for his little friend and master, Atreyu, um, Falkor had flown high into the clouds. On every side lay sea, which was gradually growing calmer after a great storm that had churned it up from the top to bottom. 
Suddenly, in the far distance, Falcor caught sight of something that puzzled and intrigued him. It was as though a beam of golden light were going on and off at regular intervals, and that beam of light seemed to point directly at him. He didn't hesitate for long. He flew high into the sky, turned around, head down, pressing his legs close to his body, which he held stiff and straight as a telegraph pole, and he plummeted. The water spouted like a fountain as he hit the sea at top speed. The shock was so great he almost lost consciousness, but he forced himself to open his ruby red eyes. By then, the blinking beam was close, only a few body lengths ahead of him. Air bubbles were forming around his body, as in a saucepan of full, full of water just before it boils. He felt that he was cooling and weakening. With his last strength, he dived still deeper, and then the source of light was within reach. It was Orin, the gem. Luckily, the chain of the amulet had got caught in a coral branch, hanging out of a wall. Otherwise, the gem would have fallen into the bottomless depths. Falcor seized it, put the chain around his neck for fear of losing it, for he felt he was about to faint. When he came to, he didn't know where he was, but for to his amazement, he was in the air, flying through the air, very fast. When he looked down, there was the sea again. He tried to slow down, but found his body would not obey him. An outside will, far stronger than his own, had taken possession of his body and was guiding it. That will came from Orin, the amulet suspended from a chain around his neck. So I wanted to have today, if I'd really thought about this earlier, an amulet to present to our captain, Heiko, to keep on the bridge of the ship. And I've ordered you one, and it will be here soon, and you will have it before you leave. I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. It shows two different snakes entwined, one representing the land of uh, Fantastica from the book, the other representing the world of reality. It is a powerful symbol and a powerful symbol of strength. We've, we've used it in one other way that you might like to use the crew on a t-shirt or something like that. We found this on the internet, so we'll have to change it a little bit. It's a little more dragony, a little more luck dragony, but maybe we can get some shirts made up for your crew with the name Falcor. And um, the other interesting thing about this amulet, one last point, on the back of it is an inscription in German. Let me see if I can say this right. I will translate it for us English speakers too. It says, du was du willst, do what you wish. And that is my wish for you, for this ship, as you go out on your mission in the world. Thank you.